slate grey skies and heavy rain. It's a good job they got the final done yesterday because if it had gone into the reserve day, I'm not sure we would have got any cricket. As it stands, England are World T20 champions and NASA, they did it in style. They did, yeah. There was a little moment there and, and Joss said it at the end when he came to chat with you. After 10 overs, he was very comfortable in the dugout. But then, it, just the Pakistan with their bowling attack, which you expect them on that pitch, came back at England. But in general, you'd say they were the best team in the tournament. And I reckon the final probably went the way most people thought it would. You were a little bit fearful of that Pakistan batting lineup. And England, you know, once they bowled them out for one three seven, were always favourites to chase that down. Let's get this out of the way first of all. Pakistan were unfortunate. They lost Shaheen Shah Afridi at the absolute critical juncture. Yes, you don't know how it would have gone had he been absolutely fit and able to bowl his two final overs. That's, uh, you know, an alternative narrative that, that could have gone anyway. But... That's part of the game, isn't it? An unfortunate injury for Shaheen. And then he had a very tricky decision to make, Babar Azam, then. Who, who do, does he go for Iftikhar to try and fill in and over then? Or does he do what he did when they played India, which is kind of go for broke with his quicker bowlers and save a spinner right till the end? He went to Iftikhar, and, of course, Ben Stokes has that, that feel for the moment. And that was the moment that he decided he needed to try and take a bowler down. So he hit him for 6 4 off the fifth and sixth balls of that over. And then Moen, I think, took three fours from the next yeah. over. And you felt then the wind had gone from Pakistan's sails and the game was done. When Ben decided to go after Iftikhar, he nearly held out to Barber at the long off boundary. And it, my mind went back to Headingley when he just chipped that one over long off in that Ashes chase. Yeah, I suppose when you play those innings, you do need little bits of good fortune to go your way. But he's always there, isn't he? You know, we talked about it at the end of the game, that quote from Joe Root in, in that documentary, the big moments find him. And it's, it's amazing. I don't know whether it's the big moments find him or he finds the big <laughs> moments, but he's always there. And, of course, as they all say, all his teammates say, there's nobody they prefer having in the middle in that situation than him. I can't remember if you picked him in your starting 11 when we did that podcast all those months ago now. Did you have Ben Stokes in or were you leaving him out? You know the answer to that because when we were doing those in, uh, when, the, when the team were in Pakistan and we were in Isleworth, even off air we were discussing and we were both discussing the value of Ben Stokes that you just had to have him in. Even though before yesterday didn't have an international T2050, even though if you look at his stats they aren't great in international cricket, but you have to have him in for those moments, for the Sri Lanka game, must-win game. Who's there at the end? Ben Stokes. Yesterday, World Cup final, Headingley. Um, he's an unbelievable cricketer. I don't know if, if these moments find him, but what England makes sure they do is that whatever form he's in, they have him in the team, that if you get to those moments, you know that Ben Stokes will deliver. And that's all you can ask of a cricketer like that, actually, because being a cricketer is about having talent, yes, but it's also delivering under the biggest, highest pressure stakes you know, of all time in cricketing terms, and he's done that on a number of occasions. Now, it can't be a, it can't be a fluke anymore. That's a, go on. So I was going to say, the one cricketer that we didn't necessarily all have in our team actually was Sam Curran, because um, if you remember when we were discussing England's team in those situations uh, you know, months ahead of the Pakistan series, at that point it was still probably perceived that if Jordan got fit, he'd be England's go-to death bowler and, and his injury of course paved the way for Sam Curran to take that role on and boy has he made that role his own he's had an incredible tournament really player of the match in the final player of the tournament um, leading wicket taker for England and just uh, incredible nerve at the end of a game so so he's had a fantastic tournament he's kind of the apprentice isn't it to, to Stokes what makes him the cricketer he is would you say I think it's character in the end. I mean, he's obviously got skill. All these players have got skill to play at this level. Um, and Curran's got a wide variety of skills. You know, he's, he's got a slower ball, he's got a Yorker. He's kind of got that slightly slippery bouncer that he unveils from time to time. But I think it's just character, really. Um, I was just listening to Matthew Mott do his, like, roundup, end of tournament roundup. Was he dusty? <laughs> they were all a bit dusty and, you know, great. You've got to, if you can't enjoy a World Cup win, when can you? But I think, you know, because it's a day-night game, they didn't leave the MCG until gone 1.30 and I think the team room was, uh, 
pretty raucous until the early hours. But he, he was saying about Curran that even in the nets, Curran kinds of he wants um, he wants Mott to put him in a match situation. So it's not just a case of some gentle throwdowns. He's saying, right, come on, um, what's the scenario here? How many do I need to win, or how many do I need to defend? He's he's looking for a, a kind of game type situation, even in practice. So I think that's the thing that turns somebody like Curran on and Stokes on. It's a, it's that real competitive instinct, and when they get into a battle, they enjoy it. Is that the difference between certain players that are invaluable to a team? It's that last little bit of competitiveness or something that sets them apart. Yeah, you're given a certain amount of talent, then you work on that talent to make yourself even better. But the character is what you absolutely need. And the character of, like Ath mentions and Matthew Mott mentions, is the character about how you practice as well, that people just turn up and presume they'll be good on the day or lucky on the day um, and things will fall in place. You know, I think Andy Flower once said to me in the Essex dressing room, he used to practice so hard and train so hard that just when he stepped over that white line and crossed that line, he felt like he had done more not only than the opposition, than some of his teammates. And mentally, that just puts you in the right place. I cannot do any more going into this game to be successful. And I think that is what Sam Curran does. I think he's very, very smart as a cricketer as well. I don't think he went for a boundary yesterday in that spell, in four overs. And we did a thing on the dimensions of the ground and bowling it into the surface. And he absolutely nailed it. He had Livingston out at deep mid-wicket and he said, I'm going to bowl it into the surface. And if you want to take on that massive boundary at the MCG, good luck to you. And Livingston just caught everything out there. He's an outstanding cricketer. We haven't even mentioned his batting because he didn't have to do much batting in the tournament down the order. There's some incredible um, individual stories from that England team, not least the return of Alex Hales. I mean, who'd have thought that a few months ago? Now he's a World Cup winner. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't think it uh, early in the summer, early last summer. I'm sure he probably thought his his career, international career, was done. He needed a few things to fall his way, didn't he? Initially, the retirement of our mate Owen, which was an essential (laughs) prerequisite for him getting back in the team. Then the loss of form to Jason Roy. Then the freak injury to Johnny Bairstow. I mean, what are the chances of all those things happening to then give him the opportunity? And even then, I suppose, it wasn't nailed on that Rob Key was going to pick him. Um, but clearly, his record in, in Australia, especially in the Big Bash here, is such that I think it was the smart choice to pick him. And then, actually, you know, he, he struggled a bit, didn't he, in Pakistan? It wasn't as though... Coming back into international cricket, he immediately took to it again. By his own admission, he took a little bit of time in that seven-match series to just come to terms again with international cricket and a bit of a slow start in this tournament. Uh, But then that was really the thing that reignited England's challenge in this competition. It was that partnership between Hales and Butler, which got going against New Zealand, flourished against Sri Lanka. Then in the semi, that high point of that magnificent opening partnership, Um, He got a good one in the final, but yeah, second chance for him. You know, at these moments, I often think about the players not there as well and missed out. So Reese Topley, who would have played probably in the in the eleven, but for that freak injury in the final warm-up game, the likes of Wood and Milan, who had made themselves available for the final, but basically were told that we're not taking a risk with you. Johnny Bairstow, who'd probably be there as well. I think I always feel a little bit for those not there in these moments. Going back to Hales, and this is no slight on what was the management before, but the fact that he was reintegrated so successfully, does that show a degree of common sense, I don't know, maturity from Rob Key, from Matthew Mark, from Joss Butler, the captain, to get him back in so, so smoothly? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think me and Nas have pretty much the same opinion on this, that a good functioning team demands respect between cricketers. You, you don't have to, you know, be best mates. You don't have to be sending each other Christmas cards, inviting each other to dinner. Certainly nobody would invite Nas to dinner. So, and he played for England for 10 years. Sadly, he's coming tonight. <laughs> but I think it just, you, you, you demand a level of respect there and that when you walk over the line, that you know that you're going to be pulling hard for each other in the same cause. You might not think 
the same things about politics or life or whatever, but come getting over that white line and walking to the middle, you know that you're going to be trying 100% for each other. And that really is what a good functioning team is, not necessarily a bunch of best mates. Well, we're certainly not going to talk politics. I want to talk captaincy, though. How well has Josh Butler done? How well has he led? What's impressed you with him? Well, the most impressive thing is that Owen Morgan is a hard act to follow, isn't it? So, and it didn't start particularly well, the, the Mott-Butler um, combination in the summer. The white ball results weren't where um, Owen Morgan had taken the side and they had some losses and there were a bit of concern, but it was only a matter of time. With the depth that Athos talks about there, even with the injury, with the depth now, and that's what I think Owen Morgan did, actually. Every, everyone talks about Owen Morgan changing a team and changing the culture of a team. I think he actually, him and Bailey, has changed the culture of white ball cricket in England. Would you put Strauss in that as well? Yeah, because Strauss, um, Strauss A, kept Morgan when he could have axed him after the Bangladesh defeat in, and the World Cup defeat in 2015. But he focused in. Some unfairly said that they went too much towards white ball cricket and took their focus away from test match cricket. But something had to be done about that white ball side. You know, test match players were being rewarded um, for their test match form to get into the white ball side, which is nonsense. And then it showed the amount of players that are out there. So, you know, Butler has taken that on. I think Butler has slowly adapted with, with time. I think initially there was a lot of gut feel and Joss is going to do it his own way. And then gradually, virtually with every game, you can see the Morgan analysis and, and hev relying heavily on analysis, Butler was taking more and more on board and by yesterday, you can imagine the team meeting the night before, whatever the analyst had put on the board, up front, try and swing it, get some swing because we messed that up against Ireland. Drag your length back as we go through. Adil Rashid in those middle overs. Adil Rashid, googly to Barber, Azam. You know, the semi-final, I thought Butler, I think Morgan himself said Butler had his best game as captain against India. He did everything right there. And he got, and he got runs. It hasn't affected his batting, which some people were concerned with. And he has enough senior players like Moen, and you've commented on the amount of times Moen is moving the field. And Joss doesn't worry about things like that. Mo, if you want to do it, you go and do that. So I think he's a great guy. He's a, he's a great player. Player, um, and, it, and English white ball cricket is in safe hands with him and Mott in charge. You could see how much affection, though, is still left over for Owen Morgan because the players just ran to him after the game. I mean, Adil Rashid was the first to come over. You were watching as Josh Butler was waiting for the presentation and he made a beeline and almost rugby tackled him. I was watching and they were waiting. He was waiting for the presentation and he looked a bit bored, Josh, <laughs> to be honest. So he saw you and Owen trying to you know, do the boring stuff that you and Owen were doing at one end of the ground. And he sprinted across and he took Owen out completely. And when they all came over, when Ben Stokes came over, I felt like that Gary Neville moment where Ronaldo comes up, doesn't <laughs> shake your hand. I was like leading over to shake hands, not interested in you, Nas. Big bear hugs for Owen Morgan. Um, it was great to see the, the affection that they have for him. Even the last bit I was doing, and four of them came. I don't know it was, Livingston, Jordan, Mo, and Adil. Um, just came and listened. How, how often do they listen to the nonsense we come out? And they came and listened just to put morgues off. They were like 12-year-olds trying to pull faces behind the camera. There was one I saw on Twitter today where morgues gave Adil a massive high five. Um, they still love their captain, and they should because um, he's made them into world superstars. They travel the world, they play franchise cricket, and they are the best white ball outfit out there at the moment. Owen always said to me that the one irreplaceable guy in the white ball setup was Adil Rashid. Has he shown his worth big time in the last two games? Semi final and then massively delivered in the final. Yeah, last three games actually, because that must win game against Sri Lanka at Sydney bowled superbly, got the player of the match in that game, bowled absolutely magnificently on a, on a helpful pitch, excellent against India. I thought his four overs yesterday in the middle were, were brilliant actually. That last, not the last over, the, the, the wicket maiden or he got Baba with the googly, and then Iftikar came in and he just bowled it kind of slower and wider, and it was really finding some turn off the surface. But he looked like a man absolutely at the top of his game and in control of his game there. So I thought that was a, a wonderful over to bowl a wicket maiden in a T20 World Cup final is a, is a thing, isn't it? Um, and I thought his four overs were excellent. That just held Pakistan in check in that middle period. And then the, the front and back were, were England's. I think they went for, what, 37 in the opening power play and just 31 in the last five overs. So once kind of Adil helped hold the middle phase of the game as well, that 137 just never quite felt enough. 
Talking a bit more generally, what have you made of the World Cup overall? I've enjoyed it. I always enjoy the World, the World Cup, the T20 World Cup, because it's pretty short and sharp. Um, there's obviously uh, a growing number of teams that are competitive in it, not just present, but competitive. Some of the results, obviously Ireland beating England, uh, the Netherlands beating South Africa, which opened the, opened the way for, for Pakistan. So that's an, always a, a nice bit of the tournament. The fans have come from everywhere. Just going down to the England team hotel this morning, bumped into a couple, one from Karachi, one had come from Ontario. You know, amazing where the, the supporters have come from. Really. I spoke from a lad who just who come in from San Francisco. Yeah, you know. no, and they're usually Indian supporters who, who come in from all corners of the globe. And they were hoping, obviously, for they'd got hoovered up tickets for the final and then trying to offload them. Um, so I enjoy that. The one plea I would make is for the World Cups not to become too frequent. I know that we've had two in two years here, and it's really because of COVID. But I think the value in these tournaments is their scarcity and to allow teams to build towards them, to to kind of grow and build on a journey, and that excitement builds. And then you have a once every four year event that is special. I I wouldn't want to see the World World Cups become humdrum and overly frequent um, because I think, you know, you you see what it means to England's players who won in 2019 and now, and that means so much because they're rare and I would like them to stay that way. I don't think that's going to change, though. It's sort of set in stone for a while, isn't it? No, I I, I mean, they're not going to come every year like we've had in the last two years. That, That was COVID in force, but there are more and more of them. And I just, and that's what we've seen with cricket generally, you know, look at the overkill for bilateral cricket, for one day international cricket. And in the end, you know, England start a, a three match ODI series on Thursday. You know, that's very similar to when they won the World Cup in 2019 and they're playing Ireland in a test match within five days. And Johnny Best have got a pair, I think, if you remember, having just, you know, won the World Cup. So it's very difficult to go and peak then in three days' time. So that's cricket. That's how it is. I'd make a plea to to just look at that very carefully. Let's have a look at the sides coming closer together, the associate sides or whatever. I've got a list here from Benedict. Go back to the 16th of October in Geelong. And Namibia beat Sri Lanka. Scotland beat West Indies. Ireland beat West Indies. Ireland beat England, of course, at the MCG. Zimbabwe beat Pakistan by one run. Netherlands beat Zimbabwe. And then the Netherlands beat South Africa, which knocked South Africa out. Is the gap closing, in your opinion? It is, especially the shorter the format, the shorter the format, um, these upsets, if you can call them upsets, because there have been so many of them, are more likely because you have a short period of play where one batter or one bowler um, plays out their skin and can take the game away from you. But actually, you look at all those results, um, and they were worthy winners, every one of them. They weren't scrambling over the line. They were seriously worthy, played the better cricket. You could argue maybe Ireland against England. England would argue at not a couple of overs of Moen and Liam Livingston, they would have got on the right side of it. But still, Ireland in that game played a heck of a lot of good cricket. Um, I thought Zimbabwe was a really good story just from a personal point of view because me and Ath um, would have been, would grown up and played against a very, very strong in our day, Zimbabwe were seriously, mm. you know, with Flower, Flower, Strang, Streak, you know, all of them, Branders, all the cricketers they had, um, Davy Houghton, their coach now, they were a very, very strong side. And I know we weren't going to talk politics, but, you know, we didn't go to, to Zimbabwe on, on a World Cup game because of politics. It ended up being because of uh, safety. But um, it is great to see Zimbabwe back where they deserve to be. They are a major cricketing nation have produced some great cricketers. So all of these countries need to be helped, though. They need to be given more and more cricket. But then the problem comes where the so-called you know, major cricketing nations are already playing a lot of cricket. Yeah. So you know, it is becoming very, very um, full on at the moment, and there needs to be gaps. So you know, I, I did laugh when, in the summer when Stokes retired from... 50 over cricket and talked about the schedule. There were quite a few people from Ireland and Zimbabwe and everyone saying, well, we would actually like a little bit more cricket, please. Let's talk about some of the sides that will have left the World Cup with a bit of thinking to do. Let's go right back to a nation that's very close to your heart, West Indies. I mean, they didn't even make it into the Super 12s. Where are they at? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of talented players in the Caribbean, lots of good cricketers. Um, and so it was sad to see 
that early exit and the way that they played here. Obviously, Phil Simmons is stepping down. I think he's stepping down after the two test series here in Australia, isn't he? So they will move in a slightly different direction. Um, and it's a cliche to say it, but cricket is a better place when West Indies are strong and vibrant. Um, I don't think you'll ever get back to the situation where West Indies was a, were as dominant as, as they were for so long. That was a kind of anomaly. Um, but, you know, even though it's their only, what, population five, six million across the islands, there's still enough cricketing talent there for them to be competitive. So, fingers crossed, they can get back to, to being, um, you know, a force to be reckoned with in, in these kind of events because they've given so much to ICC World Cups down the years. You know, they've won this one twice, the T20 twice, and obviously in their great years were, were dominant um, in the longer World Cup, so fingers crossed they can get back. I mean, I wasn't in Hobart, but watching on the television, it just looked like the, the body language was poor as well. It just looked a bit humdrum. Yeah, it did. And, you know, I suppose moving on from what was an outstanding T20 side, there's clearly a slight changing of the guard. And for any team moving on from one dominant era or good era to another can be tricky. Um, as I say, fingers crossed that they can get back sooner rather than later. And what about India? Where are they at? They're still a, a massive force. You look at their team on paper, and also we talk about the depth in English cricket, and you look at the players that they could have put, picked, especially uh, in their batting lineup. There were a couple of blows, like most sides had, you know, with Jasprit Bumrah and uh, Jadeja being injured. Um, but when it comes to knockout games, when it's bilateral games or group stage games, they and, and Rohit Sharma and Rahul Dravid came in saying they're going to change that because even Ravi Shastri, when he was working with us last summer, I did something with Ravi and asked him about this. And Ravi, as the coach of the last World Cup, said we played pretty timid cricket with the bat in particular, and that's got to change. And that's what Rohit and uh, Rahul uh, Dravid came in to try and change. And they did it in bilateral. They did it against England. Mm -hmm. Surya Kumar Yadav smashed it around at Trent Bridge, got a brilliant 115 or whatever it was. And it looked like that's it. But then you've got to take that into a game where there is, if you lose, you know the criticism you're going to get. And the first time they took that into a knockout game, they slip back into their own, uh, old ways of being 66 for, for two after 10. And yesterday, you know, Twitter was going a bit ballistic about, oh, you'd go on about India, but not Pakistan. It's a completely different thing because Pakistan don't have the batting depth, as we saw in the last five overs yesterday. They don't have the likes of Surya Kumar Yadav. They don't have all that Hardik Pandya who can come in and smash it. And also, Pakistan have a, the best bowling attack. So if they get par, as we saw yesterday, less than par, they're still in the game. If India get par against England at Adelaide, you're out of the game because of the way England can bat. So there's talk about a younger, you know, younger guns coming through. One thing's for certain, they have players. It's not the players, it is the mindset. They need an Owen Morgan type character to go in there and say, carefree cricket, 20 overs, go and smash it as much as you can for 20 overs. Play like you play in the IPL and smash it, but do it for India and don't worry about the noise. That KRL old quote, shut out the noise, really shut out the noise, we will back you if you're bowled out for 120. Do you think that's harder in India than England, for example? I mean, you talk about the Morgan impact upon England, which is absolutely right. Do you think it's harder in India for, for two reasons? One, Obviously, the greater number of cricketers and therefore the competition is much harder. So you kind of feel that if you lose your place, somebody comes in and you might not get your place back. And also the differential between match fees paid by BCCI, for example, and then sponsorship arrangements that these big names like Kohli and Kale Rahul and Rohit Sharma get. I mean, that's a huge differential, much bigger differential than in England. Do you think those two factors make it more difficult in India to do that? I think that I think you're complicating it because they are. I wouldn't be worried if they weren't incredibly talented players. I, I think Rohit Sharma. You're not talking about someone who's on the edge of a place in the side. You're talking about Rohit Sharma, who's got two double hundreds in 50 over cricket. So here is a bloke who can smash it. You know, you're talking about Kaur Rahul when you do see him play. I think it's the it's the fear 
Maybe it's a bit statistical driven as well. I thought Butch made a good comment from Pakistan when we were doing the crosses to Pakistan and we were talking about the Pakistan batting lineup and quoting their stats. I think sometimes you, you should be more than your stats and you look at all their stats, they're really good, the Indian players, but it's that match, that's the Ben Stokes thing for me. Ben Stokes' stats are really, even in test match cricket, I've had to do something for the paper today because um, I think someone, one of the press guys asked Joss, is Ben Stokes England's greatest ever cricketer? And Joss said he'd have to be in the reckoning. So you can imagine papers around the world now saying, who's England's greatest ever cricketer? Statistically, is Ben Stokes England's greatest ever cricketer? Test matches, yesterday being his first T20 international 50? Probably not. But when you want to win a game, which is what it's all about, that's all it's about is winning games. Not did you average 40. When you want to win a game, you would pick Ben Stokes every single time. So whether it be India or Pakistan or whoever, don't worry about the stats. There should be a stat right at the end of your column. How many games and how many knocks and how many catches and how many wickets won you that game? Um, and that's all that counts. There is actually now, isn't there? Do you remember the, the piece I did with the two, Mo Boba and David Court, who look after England's pathways? And we put up, if you remember, it was a very noisy uh, graphic, um, but it was one that they use in selection about, you know, all the players, statistics, batting, bowling, bowling in the first 10 overs, bowling in the last 10 overs, bowling with a new ball, old ball. But one of the columns was the win percentage, which, if you remember had a very high win percentage for Sam Curran. It was something like 69 or 70% of the games that he's played in in the last two or three years, England win. And I, I you know, put it to Mo Boba, is that just, is that noise in the data? Is it a fluke or is Sam, does Sam Curran have particular qualities that make England a better side when he plays? So they do actually take into account now games one, which you know, they're, they're just the level and, and, and the depth to the statistics are far greater than when we played. I could argue that statistically, to be honest. That doesn't mean that that person is winning that game. No. I mean, I was brilliant in all those games we lost. My stats would be really low, wouldn't they? I mean, no, well, surely all it's... All I'm saying is that they, they just, with every player, one of, the, one of the columns next to that player's name is what is your win percentage with England? And, of course... If a player suddenly has a, if a number stands out one way or the other, you, it might just provoke a conversation. Why? Why is that win percentage so high with that player in the team? Or why is it so low with that player in the team? It's just another level of conversation, isn't it? What about defending champions then? Um, our ears are burning. Sam Curran just texted me actually <laughs> talking about. Um, what about defending champions Australia though? Dumped out of their own World Cup. And I got the feeling, travelling, and you did a lot more travelling, you two, around the country, that there wasn't a great deal of love, affection for this Australian side, or am I reading too much into that? Certainly weren't the crowds. I, I was amazed by the crowds, um, because also Australia in the last couple of years have played really good cricket. You know, they've won the Ashes, um, they've won this tournament in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, um, they're a successful side. Um, I was amazed at some of the crowds. The only one that was going to have a big crowd was the MCG yeah. against England, and that was rained off. But it, the other games, you'd be, it'd be not even half full. Uh, maybe they just want to sit home. Maybe there's still you know, Aussie rules going on at the start of this tournament. Um, I, I don't know about that. I, I do know that in this format, what you can't afford is a heavy loss early on. You cannot afford that because that's almost like not only getting naught points, it's almost like getting minus half a point because with all the rain around, and we said it when England were playing Afghanistan, we said watch out for your net run rate because with the rain around, sides in the top three ended up with seven points. So Australia's loss to New Zealand in this format virtually cost them a place in knockout cricket. Uh, they just didn't have enough batters in form for me. Pat Cummins has had a hard time of it with the ball. Um, then they had a couple of injuries and COVID came in and out of their camp. Mm. Um, they never really recovered after that heavy, heavy New Zealand defeat. Maybe if they'd won that and won it well, then the crowds would have turned up and it would have grown a bit. And the MCG, if they're in the final yesterday, it would have been a sellout and a great atmosphere. But it just didn't look like they won the public over. And your pick for the tournament was South Africa, who bizarrely <laughs> didn't get through because they lost to the Netherlands. They would have done, though. Had they got through, they'd have won it. <laughs> well, had they beat the Netherlands, they didn't beat the <laughs> they, Netherlands, though. They've had a really high win percentage as well. 
No, well, what a defeat that was. I mean, you know, you just got to be a fool to back South Africa in World <laughs> Cups, haven't you? In fairness, you were looking for value in the bet, weren't you? I was. You? I was trying to look outside the top three. Um, but, yeah, South Africa's defeat was a bad moment for them. Not that it prevented us from giving Sean Pollock a huge <laughs> amount of grief when we bumped into him in the airport shortly afterwards. But, again, I mean, they've got... There's a lot of talent there with South Africa, isn't there? You look at that bowling attack, you feel, you feel that the pace bowlers should have enjoyed the conditions here, and then Riley Russo back in the team. They've got plenty of um, hard-hitting batsmen. Um, so, you know, they... They're, they're a powerhouse cricketing country and you, you, you feel that they're going to be there or thereabouts. But the, the accusation will be they've fluffed their lines again yeah. in a world event. Absolutely, and, and they keep doing so. And, you know, that argument will keep getting thrown at them or that accusation will keep getting thrown at them until they prove people wrong. Right, well, back to England. They've got three ODIs against Australia, which is going to be a challenge given that they're on such a high from winning the World T20. But further ahead, the test side reconvenes and they're going to go to Pakistan, a place where you've toured, had success. What's it like? Difficult place to win as captain, Pakistan, to be honest. I don't know who's won there. Um, it's a great tour. Ath and myself are, are going out there. We're going to be doing some various crosses to you at 4 o'clock in the morning. Lovely. <laughs> in the UK. We're looking forward to it. It is a very good tour. I just hope the pitches aren't quite as flat and turgid as they were for that Australian series. I think they were very we weary, wary of, um, of that Australian seam attack. So they took the pace out of the pitch. When in fact, with their pace attack, mm. you could take sides on. Who knows how Shane Shafridi is going to be after hobbling off. You'd be surprised if he's going to be ready. In Pakistan, in general, you need express pace. So let's hope Mark Wood is fit for England. Fingers crossed with him. And you need a bit of spin and preferably wrist spin. Um, Adil Rashid well, isn't being convinced to come back. So it, it focus will be on England spinners and who have they gone? Leach and Livingston. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they've got some spin options there. It's going to be a different pace. And the real question is that the, the, the sort of style and brand that England played at home, can they play that on those pitches out there? So uh, I think they'll go for it. I think they'll give that a go. Uh, Pakistan is, is quite a tough place to go and win. It's a different pace of cricket out there. How do you, is our cameraman falling he asleep? just <laughs> nodded off in the middle of NASA's answer. <laughs> well, he, he didn't manage to get two microphones working. <laughs> and his phone he, just went off in the background as well. We only have one microphone because our Australian cameraman couldn't get the other one to work. That's why I'm dolling both of you. <laughs> He's had a heavy night, I think. <laughs> How do you see the test tour, though? It's a different-looking squad England have picked. They haven't... The options in terms of spin, as NASA has suggested, are very sparse. So they've gone a different way with some power hitters. You mentioned Jacks and Livingston. Yeah, I'm sure they would have loved to try and persuade Adil Rashid and Mo to go back. Um, but that, that's not going to be the case. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, the way we won there, but that's a long time ago. And it was a different era, different team. The way we won there was to almost grind out a win. Um, whether... I can't see Ben Stokes having that uh, approach. Although, you know, people who just say Brendan McCullum is a completely gung-ho coach, completely gung-ho cricketer, he was a much smarter cricketer than that. This is a guy who scored, yeah. you know, 300 in two days to save a test match. So, you know, he, he'll want to try and find a way to win, and that's what you've got to do in Pakistan. It's not easy because of the flat pitches. I fear a little bit for England spinners. I mean, Livingston and Jacks to back up Leach... They're very inexperienced, even by, you know, by any standards. They're completely inexperienced. So a lot will fall on Jack Leach. But I think it's the pace bowlers that will win it there if you're going to win. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed that Mark Wood is fit. Finally, back to yesterday. I mean, what an event at the magnificent Melbourne cricket ground. You know, fans packed in, the atmosphere electric, very noisy very Pakistan-centric. It's quite interesting. I spoke to a couple of English supporters who, who'd come over and they just had such a great day. Obviously, they've come and they've seen their side win, but they were talking about the event, the experience of going to a World Cup final in the MCG. And, and I sort of got back to the hotel and I was sort of a bit, you know, it was a busy sort of day broadcasting-wise. We forget how lucky we are to go to these events. I know we're working on it, so we're looking at it from a different perspective, but it would have been an absolute joy to have been there as a spectator yesterday, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, and we're very quick to criticise if things don't go well. You know, I go back to our World Cup that we played in in England when the fireworks were sort of dribbled out at 11 o'clock and they got absolutely nailed for that. So fair play to Australia, as they often do with their events. I was here for the Women's World Cup. They put on a good show. The, great, the grounds are great. Even that, the lighting show they put on halfway, the fireworks. And I love the way the crowd seemed to build slowly through the evening. When I was doing the pitch report, there was a few Pakistan. And then by the time I got up, I said, all right, this is half full. By the time you were coming on air, it was, as you could hear, in your, you couldn't hear a word of anyone, of Morgs talking to you. Um, it was now three quarters. And by the time first ball, it was packed. And the noise and the atmosphere was just brilliant. Um, different venues different surfaces, different sizes of grounds, big outfields that brought fielding into it, and the spectators would have enjoyed it. Fabulous tournament. We're taking your mate Ian Smith out for dinner this evening. Do we need to alert the caterers? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. We'll just give them prior warning that Mr Smith is on his way. <laughs> It'll be nice to see him. It was lovely to see him and hear him on the broadcast again. What a great commentator he is. Absolutely a hero. Right, uh, gentlemen, safe travels back to the UK and then safe onward travels to Pakistan. See you all later.